So All right. why don't, yeah. let's go ahead and, and get yep. started. We've got a couple of folks here in the room. We may have a few more folks that are going to join us online. Nobody's there yet, um, but that doesn't mean they will be joining us eventually. Okay. Um, All right. Dr. Debbie Flynn, yeah. take it away. Fantastic. So, so thank you guys for, for being here. And, and I will engage in a lot of conversation because um, this is, I think, an incredibly important topic, one that I don't even think that I even recognize how important it actually is um, and so we'll just sort of go from there and so I sort of phrase this as you know so there you are you've gotten your scholarship ready you're ready to go now you have to decide where you want to publish it and that's a decision that again I think in my career I haven't paid a lot of attention to um, but now I think the, the discussion becomes do you want to publish this in an open access or a closed access journal? So this is what I think we want to cover for today. We want to actually first define what is open access. And again, I don't think that I, I always have known what this necessarily means. It means a lot more than what I thought it did. So we'll have a discussion about what it actually means. We also, I also want to talk to you a little bit about where the concept of open access came from. I think this is really important in understanding why it's there. Um, and again, I, think that I just I found this to be really interesting and very, very informative. Also, the history of data sharing. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever had any of your files or shared anything online. I have several and I have some great examples that I'll be able to talk through. Um, I don't ever go back and check on those data, thing, those data files. I have no idea where they are. I think some of us probably could be frustrated whenever we try to find some of these data sets. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of what, of what open access can provide. So as you're thinking about whether you want to submit a, an article the traditional method or an open access method, maybe you want to go through some of these benefits. Um, also, some of the concerns that are associated with open access. I have to admit, prior to doing this presentation, I would have said open access is evil. Do not, <laughs> do not do it. I have now completely flipped and I now have an article in open access. So that just tells you how much I have changed after doing this research. Um, there's also a lot of costs that are associated with publications. And so as you're making a decision about where you want to disseminate your scholarship, I think the dollar comes into your evaluation process. And so we'll talk a little bit about where those dollars are and how we can get around some of the publication costs. Um, also, there is a big difference between open access and public access. So those of you who are NIH funded, um, you have to have public access with respect to your data, and it is not the same thing as open access. So we'll compare and contrast those two concepts. And then we also were talking a little bit before um, everyone arrived, a little bit about copyright. And I think that that also opens up a whole new discussion as well. And then just some conclusions and some additional information. And so I'm Debbie, and this is Larry um, from the library. Yep. And so he and I are going to sort of team do this as we go through. And again, we open this up for dialogue, conversations, questions, and, and the like. So. so this is a typical model of, of what happens once you've decided that you want to publish your, your scholarship. Typically, what you do is then you prepare your manuscript. Um, you submit your manuscript. And there were some interesting timelines uh, when I was looking at the literature that said after you submit your manuscript, it may be about four weeks and you get your, review, your reviews back. I can tell you that four weeks is a blessing. Um, <laughs> I don't know, some of you, uh, I actually had one manuscript that was just recently under review for one year. Um, and I think that that's obscene. One of the things that I think we'll talk a little bit about is that open access could, might streamline this process so that instead of being hung up for four weeks or a year, you might be able to get your scholarship out faster. That might actually be a factor when you're deciding on what method you might want to have your paper published in, especially if you're going up for tenure or you're getting a review and all of a sudden you want to show your scholarship, you might want to decide to streamline this process and get it out there a little bit faster than, than other ways. So and typically, you might send your manuscript out. It might be a new review for four weeks, again, if you're lucky. Then you get, then it goes to the editor. It might sit with the editor for one week. It might sit with the editor for longer than that. If you happen to flank a holiday season, it might be with the editor for a lot longer than that. Um, but then you might get your comments back. 
and then they will either accept or reject your paper or put it into some sort of non-reject, non-accept status. Um, you might have some time to revise it and then it will go back out for review again. Sometimes it goes all the way back to the original reviewers. Sometimes it goes back to brand new reviewers and sometimes it goes back just to the editor and it all depends on, on the journal. Um, this can be an incredibly frustrating process. Uh, I have had one manuscript that I really, that, that we rewrote and rewrote and rewrote, addressed every single one of the, the reviewers' comments and concerns, and at the very last second it was rejected. I unfortunately, for my postdoc, did not stand up. I should have gone right back to that editor and said, wait just a minute. We did absolutely everything. This is a data paper. Um, we put it in for cell metabolism, which has a very high impact. It had nine trillion tons of data, and they rejected it. And what happened was I was moving, my postdoc moved to Chile, and we got caught, both of us, at the airport when we found out it was rejected. I really should have been immediately gone back to that editor. So I just, it, I really strongly encourage, if you really feel like you have a strong case for this article not to have been rejected after you've revised it, stand up, go back to that editor, pitch your case, um, and see if you, if you can. Especially when it involves a student, I think we owe it to our students to, to be that champion for them. So I, I, my student and I, we talk about it all the time, we really regret not having worked a little bit harder on that paper. So, okay, so now you have the chance, and again, I don't think this was probably even available five years ago, um, but now you have the opportunity to decide as you're getting your paper ready for submission, do you go open access or do you go the traditional route? And so now this is becoming a much greater decision, I think, that all of us can have the opportunity to make, and there's many benefits for one direction or the other, and we'll talk more about that. And one thing I just want to mention, on this slide, there's a URL for something called Sherpa Romeo, which is a great resource. It says, it's under there where it says, check publishers' policies on, and it's a resource that allows you to look by publisher and by journal and see what their what their attitudes are their typical attitudes are towards open access to different kinds of open publishing and also retaining author rights. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so you might think about okay, maybe I'll check into this open access thing. So what is open access? It means anyone can freely access, use, modify or share the, the data or your paper that you're publishing. This is truly, it's basically out there for the whole world to see, and, and I think it's a really interesting way of approaching how we actually share our data and our science. So we'll talk a little bit more about why this might become important. And then this is just another definition of what open access is, and the basic concept here is that there are about 25,000 peer-reviewed journals that are out there. There is no library that could ever own all of the subscription or many or the publication. What's the right word for that? Uh, subscriptions. subscriptions yeah. yeah, could never own all the subscriptions to those twenty-five thousand publications, twenty-five thousand different journals. So basically, you're at the mercy of your library as to whether you, you say you want to access a, a, an article. Perhaps the library doesn't own a subscription to that library, to that journal. Therefore, you have to buy the subscription. And some of those are really expensive, right? right. I, I'm quite shocked about how expensive some, in order to get a paper, it can actually be. So this is sort of the advent for why people have, have, are really now talking about the uh, ability for all of us to have access to these data rather than having to pay for the subscription or pay for the actual article. And something that's closely related to this is obviously we're at an institution that does have a library that has subscriptions, but there are lots of researchers who are in less well-funded institutions in other parts of the world where access to journal articles is much more difficult to come by. And so open access is a way of addressing that as well, kind of as a social justice mission. I don't know, some, some of you might be old enough, back in the day when I first started, we actually had reprints, had paper reprints. And that used to be like every Friday, I would sit there and just fill out the reprints and send an actual paper copy to, especially people who didn't live in the United States because they didn't have access to some of these journals. It used to take a lot of time. Now you can just send off your PDF, but um, 
this is a, it's a really important thing, especially for people who don't live in the United States. It's almost a, a part of global access, right, of, of getting the data. Um, so there's an increasing number of, of journals that are now offering the open, open access uh, method of, of actually publishing your data. And this is just looking at a trend, and this is up, up to 2014, but I'll bet you it increases exponentially even from 2014 even to now, um, with many, many more uh, journals offering an open access uh, availability for your publications. Some of them are even hybrids, like I just found one recently, um, and I'll talk more about this, but I submitted a paper to Mayo Clinic Proceedings as a reasonable impact factor, um, but it actually has both an open access as well as a traditional format. Um, and so I actually, after, again, after this presentation, submitted it for open access, the paper that was just accepted. And I'll give you some of the rationale for why I ended up doing that. So this is, again, sort of like what I was just saying to this. There's a variety of now different types of journals. You have the nonprofit publishers, the commercial publishers, and the exclusively only open access. So you have uh, journals that are these sort of hybrids. And I think it's going to be really interesting over time to see how it influences the visibility of the journal, whether it changes the overall We'll talk a minute, in, in a minute about the impact factor, but it'll be really interesting to see whether how open access changes some of the dynamics that we currently see in the journals. So what's the origin of open access? And I found this to be really amazing. And it, in the idea, there's, there's two different origins, but the first is that with the advent of the internet, there is so much that you can get from the internet. Why not make your manuscript open to the internet. Um, and that, that's, that was sort of one of the reasons I think that it became, that was one of the origins. And they said within the, with the availability of internet bandwidth, print articles have become virtually redundant. And that again goes back to, the, you know, on my Fridays when I would send out all my reprints, they were actual print papers of, of they were print copies of my manuscripts. And now you don't have to do that anymore. You just have a PDF and away it goes and you can send it. So there's, with the internet and with PDFs and all of our, our technology capabilities, the idea of actual paper copies of journals becomes somewhat obsolete. And I, I, I mean, I, I never go, although my husband actually subscribes to the New England Journal of Medicine, um, so it's the only time I actually pick up an actual journal and look at it in, on paper. Um, we usually share it whenever we're on an airplane together just because, but, but you really hardly ever pick up an actual paper journal anymore. We subscribe to very few print journals these days, and the ones that we do are primarily in art and design fields where the image quality is still paramount. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so as a consequence, in theory, the cost of publication should have decreased. Unfortunately, if you try to publish in like the New England Journal of Medicine or any of these other journals, what you will actually find is that the cost of publications has increased. And I think they're trying to offset their own publication costs by increasing, by causing us to have to pay so much more to get our article published. And so this is just saying that there's wide dissatisfaction right now with publications because of this increased cost. And oftentimes I, I should spend, spend more time looking at this, but when people submit grants to the NIH, we should always have a publication cost associated with any type of grant that we're submitting because this is not insignificant. It can really cost a lot of money to publish your scholarship. So it's important to have a set aside pile of monies to be able to offset that cost. And again, it should have been decreasing, but instead it's actually been increasing. And one thing I'll just mention about um, asking for funding when you, uh, publication funds when you apply for a grant. Uh, I have an acquaintance who's the uh, head of grant funding programs at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And she was telling me that she's often surprised that people don't ask her for publication, even after the grant is, is given, if they didn't have uh, funds set aside. You know, if you ask her, she will give it to you because they paid for the research. They want the findings out and published. That's amazing. Wow, that's fantastic. I don't know that NIH would do that, <laughs> um, but, but good to know maybe some of the smaller foundation grants would actually go back and provide you some money because again they do want their data out there so that's fantastic yeah and there's so many very like local grants for like graphic
master's initiatives, part of that grant says, you know, we'll, that you need to consider publishing your findings in open access right. journals so that, they can, so that a broader community can access your information. Fantastic. So it's part of the grant. Fantastic. Outstanding. All right. Also, um, this goes back again, where um, that only about 75% that's probably even an overestimation, mm -hmm. of all of the possible data out there is readily accessible. Where if you had it as open access, it would allow everybody to have access to your data. And that's really what we want, is we want wide dissemination of this information that we spent so much time and effort gathering. We want to get that information out in the public domain as much as possible. Um, also, it has the potential to impact research um, so if your article is in some obscure journal that nobody carries, then all of a sudden you're not going to get a lot of access for your article and the impact factor of that article will be relatively low. But if you have open access, then everybody has the ability to download your article and it gets much, much more wide dissemination. So um, the other idea is that access to, to research should actually be 100% disseminated. Everyone should have access to it, especially if it was fu funded by the government or whoever it was funded by. Those individuals who fund your research want everybody to have access to that research. Um, so a major principle of underlying the ownership of the results is that any publicly funded research or data are public goods, therefore the public has the right to have access to it. And the reason we actually are having this seminar is that you found this, this YouTube um, uh, presentation about someone who is very, very passionate about the fact that if our government or anybody has funded this research, all of us should have access to it. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that YouTube. Yeah, it was it was really amazing. He, uh, it was a TED Talk, and he was talking about disseminating information, right, and how in practice, right, we're, we're not using evidence-based research because there are all these barriers to getting it. Right, so I'm a practitioner. I work for maybe a small community hospital. I don't have those resources, right, with a research library. So I can't get the articles that I need to then inform my practice at the bedside. And he was just kind of lamenting and saying, there's so much information out there and so much quality work that we can't then bring to the bedside. Why are you doing research if we can't access it? And then he went into the whole spiel about open access publishing and how it's not, you know, it's not the evil <laughs> of publishers, you know, they're not just there taking your money, right? They really do want people to have access to this information so it can actually be applied. And how, as a community of scholars, that we can kind of vet each other, right? So if somebody publishes something in open access, and it's a bucket of crap, the rest of us can say, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Like your, you know, your findings aren't consistent with the data that you presented or with, you know, whatever, with, with the reality of practice. So that we then become each other's peer reviewers rather than having this little secret group of people in a back room reviewing people's articles and going, no, this isn't valid or this is valid. You have a broader community than of peers and you can have that dialogue with your broader community. So I thought it was really interesting. And how he said, you know, the speed then of that research that we're doing that's disconnected from the patient care experience, you know, our interactions, it, it can get to then that patient care faster than it does now. Because it's often years between the study that you do in the lab with whatever and then the change that comes in practice. So I, I was like, this is really interesting. <laughs> and it really was. And we should, well, we can share it to everybody as well, right? Because it, oh, it, yeah. it's it's like it, he's very passionate about yeah. this, incredibly passionate. <laughs> but but it, but I think it raises our conscious level about this is a this is a big deal. And I, I haven't really appreciated again the fact that that all of this money that's spent, not everyone has access to the data that's been generated. So I think it's really really important. Um, okay. So this is this was hilarious. I found this on the internet as well. But open access, <laughs> um, and this was just sort of a history of how data sharing occurs. And so the first was that back in like 1965, we had these uh, centralized data centers where people looked up 
different genetic codes and it was all different crystal structures and it was put on this central repository. But then we started to have the snail mail, right? <laughs> the, and those of us who are old enough in this room recognize these floppy disks. And I, I do remember having a floppy disk with all of my data on it. Um, so that, that, that cracked me up as well. And then, um, then we had things like GenBank. And I, I even have a paper, uh, although it was published after 1989, but I do have a paper with GenBank. Um, but I never ever go to GenBank to see what's in there ever. Um, but, but this was the next way that we started to say, oh, we'll have this big huge data repository and everybody will share it and it will be all wonderful. But I don't think we've ever gone back to GenBank. Um, and then, then we had supplementary data online. And has anyone ever published supplementary data online? I have, and um, I, have to, I have to admit, I have no idea. I have to go back to wherever that article is. I don't even know where that data is, even if you could access it. Um, but, but back in the day, this was the way that we actually put a lot of data with supplementary, just because the journal maybe only allowed us to have three data tables. And so in order to be able to get the paper published, we put seven other data tables in the supplementary stuff online. Um, but then this was, this cracked me up. This was actually, it's probably hard to read in the red print here, but it took people months before they realized that the data wasn't even actually published oh, no. in the paper. I, luckily, this is not my paper, but, but I can understand where oftentimes that supplementary data never made it onto the, the publications. And sometimes that supplementary data is absolutely critical for interpretation of the data that they're talking about in the paper. Um, I also will admit that oftentimes if there is a supplementary data table, I didn't always, if I was reviewing, the, not reviewing the paper, if I was going to look at that data for future reference, I didn't always go to that supplementary data table to look at it either. Um, so this was really a place where you put it, but nobody ever really cared or looked at it. Um, and then uh, this is just to say that if you build this data set, not everybody will come. Um, it takes a lot of effort to go through and weed through and figure out how to access that data that might be online to go with that paper. Um, so just because it's there doesn't necessarily mean that anybody ever actually used it. Um, and also, this is just to say that there's probably a lot of data that shouldn't always be online. There's probably, especially um, with HIPAA compliant data, there might be data sets that never should have been allowed to be uh, open access or embedded on some sort of table. Um, that, that perhaps is another example of we want to make sure that if we have data that's available that it has been HIPAA compliant, right? Exactly. Um, so, so basically, this is um, what it, open access does is it maximizes the access for research findings, it increases the research impact to a wider readership, it expands the shared knowledge across the scientific field, um, and over time, it might increase the journal's impact factor. So how many of you are aware of the impact factor? Or does the impact factor of the journal influence whether you publish in that journal? Probably sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I always am confused about what actually an impact factor is. So the number one publication, health-related health publication, that has the highest impact factor is the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but I have to admit, I have three articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. They are not the articles that I have that are the most cited. So even this, despite the fact that in theory, because they're in the New England Journal of Medicine, they should be my highest cited reference papers, they're actually not. Um, but, but the way that you calculate the impact factor is the number of articles, or number of times the article has been cited. And this is just another, um, just a graphic of how to do that. But what's interesting is that the New England Journal of Medicine, when you submit a paper there, they want you to refer, if there's any literature to support your findings they, that has, has previously been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they want you to be sure and include that, right? So the journals themselves are wanting you to refer to that journal in your bibliography so that they get another citing. Um, so there is a little bit of work that goes in also, journals love review papers um, because they increase the number of sightings, which increases their overall impact factor. And then some of the discussions that go on in, in bibliometrics you know, forums is how do you go back, back out some of that self-citation 
and um, and the you know citation kind of padding that goes on. Um, so that's you know something else that it, that gets noticed. And it should because oftentimes what you can see is that an author will submit an article and they self refer like 25 of their own manuscripts within the bibliography. Um, that's probably excessive, but, but you oftentimes see it. And sometimes when I'm reviewing an article, I'll actually look for that as well. But all of that would influence the overall impact factor. But I, I'm not certain that, I, I mean, I, I know it's the standard that we use, but I, it certainly is not, I don't know. It, there, there's a wide discussion of, you know, how much weight should be given to uh, impact factor is one. There's the H index, which is a fairly common one. There's um, eigenfactor, which is very complex. Um, there are lots of different measures that, that get thrown around. And probably the best solution is kind of take a sampling of, of all of them. Um, they each have pluses and minuses. There's also, as you mentioned, forthcoming measures on the slide. Um, there's, um, the last several years, there's been something called altmetrics. And that takes into account things like social media shares and, um, and discussion posts um, that show people actually engaging with your content, even if they're not necessarily actually citing it in a paper. That seems really important, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like the conversation. That's that organic conversation that maybe someone who's not going to do research and publish, but they're interested in your topic and they're carrying that into from the research world into the real world. So that's also why you'll see a lot of people when they put out a, a new article, they'll make sure to share it on Facebook, they'll, they'll tweet it, they'll add it to LinkedIn, and because it, it gets the word out, it, yeah. it spreads, you know, spreads awareness. For the art metrics, do we need to like go through the journal because I've realized that sometimes when I share it on Twitter, it may not reflect on all metrics, but if I go and share it from the journal link to Twitter, that counts. That's right. that's counting from all. Yeah. The, oh, good point. Yeah, though you'll want to use, um, you know, make sure that you uh, tweet or share the canonical URL, so the, either the permanent URL from the publisher or the DOI that comes with the other. That's a great point. I also think that it's probably for junior faculty. It's important to know what the uh, promotions committee is looking at, right? Because if the promotion committee is looking specifically at the impact factor of your journals, that's one thing. If they're looking at your age index, that's one thing. All of these should go into the, your decision matrix as you decide where to publish your paper. Where I was in, um, in Dallas, Texas, CPT Southwestern, it went all by impact factor. You could have one paper at a super high impact factor or you could have 25 at a low impact factor, and those 25 didn't count to the same degree that the one did in the high impact factor. So you'll, you really, especially junior faculty, want to know what is the standard for promotion and tenure within your university or within your college. So this is just looking at um, how open access now is starting to increase the overall impact factor of the different journals, which makes sense because it's the journal has the ability to share that information widely, there's going to be more hits on that article, that therefore the impact factor might go up. But this was one citing. This is another one that showed that someone else did some research looking at the overall impact factor and open access and found that when they reviewed it, that 47% uh, of the studies found that there was a citation advantage if you actually utilize open access. There were seven studies or seven percent that show that there was no no conclusive evidence to indicate that your um, open access journal had a favorable impact on the impact factor um, and then there were 17 that had no citation advantage this will be really and i'm sorry that i don't have a reference on this this will be really interesting to watch as this trend moves forward my prediction is that as more journals are going to provide open access that will it truly impact the impact factor um, and therefore, this this will be this overall this scheme will change. But do you think part of that that the studies that found no citation advantage is sort of part of the bias that without looking at open access, which you've already shared, people had this bias against open access journals. So maybe you know, that's part of 
what they saw in the study. I'm, I'm, I haven't read it, so I'm not sure, but like that would be what I would take from that. Like, is it because people are not using them because they were biased? It could also be a difference in, in what field they're in. Yeah, that's true. So they STEM fields picked fields. up open access uh, much earlier than humanities fields have. So that could be, there could be some perceptual difference between those. Why is that? Why do you think that is, that humanities one is quicker? Uh, partly, the humanities tend to put their primary attention more in monographs, mm -hmm. so long form book publishing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's also, they're more likely to publish with small society publishers mm -hmm. that are relatively low cost versus, you know, high energy physics journals that cost, you know, almost five figures. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. And so this is just listing uh, the impact factor for some of and some of the journals and like loss biology, those actually are what some of those hybrids, right? So you actually they're both open access and, and traditional. Um, and so so the plus is there those are actually born open access. Okay, so those are, they're solely open access, but they um, they uh, started off as grant as grant funded and um, Some of the others some of the others are more are a little bit more uh, interesting. Yeah. Plus, you actually also have to have, know somebody on the editorial board. Well, I don't know if that's oh, just PNAS. 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 Yeah. 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 All right. So, open access makes research available to anyone with an internet connection. Um, open access transcends academic affiliations and supports sustainable lifelong learning which is really interesting as well. Um, I found this to be fascinating that it actually, there's examples of different types of people. And I can think of our, our patients, right? Patients wouldn't necessarily have access to a library. They wouldn't be able to get the data. And now with open access, now all of a sudden they have the ability to read some of the scholarship that's coming out from the university where they probably didn't have that ability to do that before. I'm even thinking that open access also probably for potential donors or funders mm -hmm. is probably really important as well. They, they, want to go, they want to get in there and see where their money's gone or how their money's influenced overall the impact of healthcare. Um, so I thought that this was really interesting. So open access can benefit citizens, um, medical patients, health advocates, non-government um, NGOs or the non-government organizations, um, and then those who benefit from translation or transformative I found this to be interesting. People who were sight impaired actually benefit from open access because they can, there's different ways that they could, right. they could hear that where before they wouldn't have had access to that information at all. So I found that to be fascinating that there were populations of individuals that also can benefit that, that we've been missing. And another category is um, our alumni mm -hmm. who graduate and if they go off and work in a, in a less well resourced organization, um, they would lose access to these materials you know, with some caveats, uh, but open access materials they would have access to wherever they end up. I found this to be interesting too, that open access actually enhances rigor and reproducibility, and you kind of alluded to that. Um, and that is that oftentimes the lack of reproducibility, the, the, the NIH has really hit this because I think so much was not able to be replicated, probably a lot, in large Part because there might have been the methods were in a supplementary table or a supplementary data that people couldn't find. But NIH, because there's been so much lack of reproducibility, now you have to address this specifically in your applications with rigor and reproducibility. And the idea is that publicly sharing data and materials can actually alleviate some of these problems with reproducibility. Um, and so this is. Um, just something that says those who share data do better science. I couldn't agree with that more. In the basic science side, um, so often you just read the methods of a paper and there is absolutely no way that you could follow what they printed in, that, in, the, in their publication. You could never do the study, ever. Um, you actually have to contact the author who probably themselves, like. 90% of the time, I wouldn't have known how to do a certain experiment that was done in my lab that was done by the postdoc or the graduate student. So if you contact me and you say, well, what buffer did you use for your reagent? I wouldn't know. And I'd have to then track down the graduate student or the postdoc and pray that they actually knew 
And it was really important so that we could replicate those studies so we could move the science forward. But nine times out of 10, we couldn't do this. So this becomes incredibly important. But if in open access, you, have, you air all of your dirty laundry, you let everyone know exactly how you did the experiment, that will really enhance uh, reproducibility. Um, and so sometimes, again, this is just my point here, which is if you email the author, again, they may or may not tell you how the study was done. Um, that has happened to me more times than not, where for whatever reason, maybe uh, a postdoc did the studies, they didn't necessarily use best practices. Um, the PI may have found out along the way, people already published, sometimes then that information doesn't disseminate, and there is no way you can ever reproduce this data. And those are that's a crying shame when that happens, but having open access would alleviate a lot of these problems. So what are the negatives? Well, I think the negative, and I came in with this dogma when I started looking at this, is that it's oftentimes thought that you are doing less reputable science if you go for open access, that you've actually paid to have your, your data published. That is, could, is no, has no bearing on it, um, but unfortunately there are some unscrupulous journals that are out there, and this is Beal. This is the person, right. so you wanted to make a comment on this, right? Right, um, so a lot of um, attention that was paid to predatory publishing um, was raised by a guy named, um, I think it's Jeffrey Beal, so he was a librarian uh, in Colorado. Um, and so he created something that's called Beal's List. And uh, it's now no longer officially available. He, he, he left his position and he took down his site. Um, but it's still available in archive versions around the web. Um, one of the criticisms that has come up over the last few years is that he really had kind of an axe to grind against open access publishing um, and um, used basically hidden criteria for, um, for some of his evaluation of journals and publishers um, that hasn't borne up when, when others have gone through and evaluated those same journals and publishers. Um, so now there are other solutions that are available. The Directory of Open Access Journals, or DOHA, uh, has revamped their vetting requirements to list a journal, um, and then they go back and monitor compliance with their best practices. And so that's that's kind of a good way. There's, um, let's see, it's uh, OASPA is an organization of open access publishers that similarly has best practices um, that their members have to adhere to. Um, and then there's another website um, that is linked from the library guides for, for open access um, that's called Think, Share, Submit. And it's thinksharesubmit.org is the URL. And it gives um, authors guidelines on how to evaluate the journals that they're considering uh, publishing for. And so that's just uh, adds a little, I guess, color to that discussion. Exactly. So, so oftentimes I thought, okay, so if what you're doing is basically you're paying to have your paper published, even whether it's crud or not. Um, but now it's clearly that that's not the case. That that they're they're those open access are allowing, they're encouraging, they are submitting the standard way where you have a peer review, a vetting of your of your data, and then if you meet the muster, then you're able to publish your paper. Um, so there are definitely uh, costs that are associated with publications. Um, and so there's numerous types of costs. In the standard method of, of publications, these were called article processing charges. Um, and these were management fees um, to take care of the, the edit editing, the paper publication, and all of the different costs that are associated uh, with actually publishing your work. And so it used to be that um, again, some of these journals are very, very expensive, um, and so you're offsetting the typesetting, you're offsetting the cost of all of that. Um, and so, again, what used to be that, or the thought was that they, with the wide dissemination of information with the web, that maybe these costs would be reduced, and say, as we talked about, that costs have actually gone up exponentially. Um, and so, with open access, though, there is, there are two different models. There's the, um, 
where am I going here? That with open access, in theory, there should be very minimal costs associated with the open access publications. There's no paper, there's no typesetting. The data should be able to get out there in a really quick fashion. Um, but some journals are actually still cause, are charging you. Um, so, for example, the Mayo Clinic, the paper that I was referring to, we had the option of either printing it in a traditional way or open access. In order for me to publish it open access, it was $3,500. Um, so some, th that's a lot. Um, I, I did go the open access route on this one, um, but, but oftentimes those costs are, are really prohibitive in being able to afford the types of publications. Um, so just looking at, um, the, again, this is the reason, so open access, don't they don't generate their own revenue. Um, they, don't, they don't have a subscription. So sometimes there might be a higher cost associated with publishing and open access. But there are ways of actually reducing the cost. So you can go into the journal and say, I'm coming from an underrepresented uh, university, or I myself don't have the funds to be able to do this. I think the O journals are actually have some ability to some wiggle room so that they can negotiate some of the publication costs. I don't know if you have any information on that. There, there are some there are some journals that have institutional memberships. Um, right now, the only one that Drexel currently has is with Sage Publishing. It's a ten percent discount. Um, and then there are um, yeah there are a variety of of options to you know waive a publishing charge if you're from a um, a, a developing country or that sort of thing. Um, and something else to, to bear in mind with the uh, with closed access articles, um, there may still be a charge even for a closed access publication, a page charge, uh, or other publication fees. Um, and then one of the um, one of the things that you know, open access or closed access, many of the commercial publishers are publicly traded companies that have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders to return profit. And so that's an additional layer in addition to all of the, you know, real costs of putting out a journal article. The return for the shareholders is, is a part of that. Oh, I'm sorry, the one before had the cost for uh, color. Oftentimes you get a huge cost to have anything in color. And some of the basic science, you have to have the color because it's done in, you know, whatever. Um, but, but I just had a, uh, one of my journals, one of my publications, we were given the opportunity to go in for the cover art. Um, there was actually a cost for that. I was really surprised. I was really excited that we got to be the cover of the journal, but, but there was a, a fee associated with that too. So there are hidden fees all over the place. Um, but again, we need to make sure that they're included in our, our grants. Um, okay, so there's different routes to open access. They, they, came, they come in different colors. There's the green route, the gold route, and the hybrid route. There's also evidently bronze and platinum as well. And these just have to do with, um, like, for example, the gold route of getting published in open access it was open access from birth. Um, it doesn't rely on commercial publishers, and yet you still are going to have a charge. So I think that these different colors are associated with perhaps the amount that you're going to have to pay. Well, or just they're 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 separate models. Um, so for the, for instance, the platinum. Um, which often is also called diamond, um, although I think that changes the, the metal to mineral <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, it's important to be consistent. Uh, so, uh, so platinum journals um, are fully open access journals, but the there is no uh, author or article processing charge. It's often paid for by a grant or an institution. Um, so the costs are still there, but you're but as an author, you're not the one paying that. That cost. Bronze is really just NIH public access. It's not necessarily truly open um, in terms of licensing, um, but it's free to read for for the public normally after an embargo period of uh, six months to a year or sometimes up to three years. All right, so that gets us right over here to open access versus public access. So, so NIH is mandatory uh, public access. And this was due to John Holdren, Holdren um, putting this mandate that because research has been paid for through the government, therefore it must have public access. Um, 
And so there is now, a, there's a process, as, as you alluded to, um, that you have to, so if your paper has been um, funded by your grant, uh, then, then therefore it must go through PubMed Central, it must get that specific identifier, excuse me, um, and you must uh, comply with this. So where public access is again through the NIH websites, um, open access is, is different. So they both are allowing the public to have access, but public access is a specific entity. Um, NIH will delay processing of awards. This is now, so public access is now getting teeth. And this is actually, this was, you, you do not want this to happen. Grant awards were actually held up funding because the uh, person who had received the grant was not putting their data through public access. So make sure, um, I actually have them on my, thing, my list of things to do to make sure that all of my papers actually have hit um, public access because it does require you to deposit them into that portal um, and you would hate to have your grant funding held up because you were not compliant with this requirement. So make sure that, they're, that you're well aware of the distinction between public access with an NIH uh, funded grant versus open access. Okay, so I know our time is getting close. Um, I thought that the copyright was something that was really important. So in the digital age, copy of, uh, basically there, um, when we, oftentimes whenever I would get an article published, the copyright would go with the article or with the journal. Um, and that's not the case with open access, right? So I don't know if you wanted to speak. We had this sort of conversation right. briefly, but. Uh, so in a true open access publication, um, the copyright will stay with the author or whoever initially had the copyright. You don't transfer it to the journal. What you're doing is um, by using an open license, you're giving the, um, the publisher a non-exclusive license to use the work in their journal. Um, and that's something that is possible to do even with, uh, even with closed access publications uh, when it comes time to get the copyright transfer agreement or the publication agreement, depending on how they, they label it. Um, these are agreements, these are contracts you're able to negotiate. Um, and as I mentioned before, Sherpa Romeo is a website that tells you what specific journals and specific publishers often agree to. Um, and so they may agree that you keep the copyright and you just give them a license to, to publish it. They may agree to um, allow you to put the article into an institutional repository or disciplinary repository. That's often called green open access. Um, and normally what you would do, submit then, is the um, author accepted manuscript. So it's the last peer reviewed version of an article before it got the publisher's um, typesetting. Um, and then they may also agree to, to a full open access where you can do whatever you want with your, with the publisher version. Um, so there's lots of different options. Uh, the main idea is you have to think about what is important to you, what, what uses you want to retain um, and abilities you want to retain to your license and then make sure that the agreement reflects what you're willing, what you're, what you're willing to accept. Um, and not to be afraid that the publisher will say no, they normally don't. They, know, they may say, you know, okay, well, we want to have the copyright. They're, they're very rarely going to say, we're not going to publish your article now that you've tried to negotiate with us. They put a lot of effort into the article. They want to see it hit print um, after all that peer review and everything. Um, so they will normally work with you. Um, can I just, yep. Can we also plan a copyright discussion? Because that's really why I'm here. Um, from that meeting the other day, Arun and Deb, that we, you know, there's a lot of issues with us mentoring students. What's theirs? What's the university's? What faculty? What's ours? What's the university? You know what I mean? So all those kinds of things are really important. Uh, I think it could be a separate issue. Um, yeah, so, we are just starting in the library, just starting to plan a uh, scholarly communication seminar series okay. that will be monthly events. Um, and author rights is, is one of the one of the okay. topics that we want to. So 
Great. Yeah, Monday, right? Thank That'll you. probably be um, maybe late spring, early summer. Because I had a weird situation. And again, it, can you point to uh, the one that helps you know the difference between predatory open access journals and in here? Is it the, the Beal article? Uh, I, would, I would not use the Beals now, um, but there are probably the easiest way would be to look and see if that journal is listed in the directory of open access journals, which is also doaj.org. Okay. Um, because that because they have a they vet who gets onto their list okay. and um, journals that are not as reputable get taken. Okay. Uh, the other helpful. thing is to uh, is to talk to your librarian. Right. Um, in this case, you know, in CNHB right now, it's Janice. Uh, if you talk to Janice, okay. she will either know or she'll come and talk to me and we can, right. and we can take a look at it. Thanks. The other thing, especially if you're working with students, um, is if they are approached from a publisher and are especially are, are, are uh, given the impression that there will be a very fast turnaround and they discuss the payment up front, those are red flags. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if they're coming to a yeah. unknown yeah. kind of junior researcher and saying we want to publish your article, that's that's a warning sign right there. Right. Um, and especially with dissertations, uh, if they're reaching out to you and saying we want to publish your, your dissertation as a book, it sounds great to get that book deal right away, but you normally want your book to have some editorial assistance and be made to, into a better product sure. with a with a broader audience than a dissertation normally has. Those are all things to kind of. Which again worry about. reminds me then of another question that relates to this somewhat. Um, uh, embargoing of materials, like how that plays out. For example, one of our doctoral students, we wanted to reference, like, or look at a dissertation, but we couldn't get access to it because it's embargoed, right. you know, and what that process is uh, understood because now yeah. my students are saying I'm embargoing everything you know kind of thing in most cases the embargoing is is unnecessary it won't affect the publication with a reputable scholarly publisher okay um, but there are reasons when it, it does make sense if you're going to be filing for a patent for instance um, or if you're a grant funder you know or you know if the grant funder especially if you're working with a private company, um, you know, need to keep that, keep that quiet, um, or if it's anything classified, um, if it's a, you know, a DARPA project or something. Um, those are reasons to, to, to hold it back. But if it's fear that their, that their book won't be published, that has largely been, um, been proven not to be the case. Mm -hmm. But is it, is it our library? for X number of months. Right, uh, yeah. It's it's yeah. yeah, it's at request of the individual. Uh, right? the individual with the approval of their dissertation advisor. The dissertation okay. advisor is the one who has to say whether or not uh -huh. the the embargo should be granted. The library will just take whatever uh -huh. the advisor recommends. I've already gotten that request and we're not even at proposal yet. So I'm just, yeah. you know, it would be helpful to understand I think that's the logic a, behind these kinds of things. I think that's a fallacy, though, throughout doctoral education because they, your students will get very nervous and they're like, I want to embargo everything because they're afraid somebody's going to steal their dissertation if they don't. And that's not true because in, in the program, when I was in my doctoral program, that was the advice. And then I went and I researched it and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, it's not like I'm creating a new, I don't know, cure for cancer or something, you know? So I didn't. And that was probably the best thing I ever did because that connected me with researchers globally that were interested in my topic. Mm -hmm. So they didn't come and steal my stuff, but they wanted to talk to me about what I had done. And if I had embargoed that, then it would have, you know, been hidden for a longer period of time and put me further away from my work that I did. Right. So I didn't, I've had no one steal any of my but right. so I think we just don't understand, at least I don't understand what the rules are. And and even beyond that, there's issues sometimes with like research gate and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, right. are you allowed to put this on? Who, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 And so now I just don't do anything now. I'm like, oh, I'm scared, you know, so I don't put anything on there. And you can always talk, uh, you could 
talk to me or you can talk to Janice uh -huh. uh, and, and we're happy to you know um you know as uh, as the saying on the internet goes you know I am not a lawyer and I am not your lawyer uh, <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt what we're talking about is you know what are best practices that are acknowledged in the library world mm -hmm. um and so your own specific case might be different mm -hmm. um but um but yeah we're happy to offer um you know what is the best practice and, I usually and answer any questions emails to be honest and yeah. one i wished i had saved and i looked for it, but it's just conversation because on friday after the meeting that we had about copyright i got this weird article this weird request from somebody writing a book tell referencing a article i had written a couple of years ago and saying we want to put this as book chapter into this you don't have to do anything um and you'll retain copyright. And I'm like, this is crap, you know, and I just deleted it. But it would have been a good example for like, you know, you don't know, right. that's the point. You don't know what the heck's coming at you. And some of it sounds interesting and good, but you know, kind of do something you don't have anything to do and they're gonna publish this. It's like, yeah, I don't yeah. think so. Weird. Yeah, I usually don't say that. Yeah. If, if it that sounds too good to be true, that. it normally is. I've never seen that before. That's why I said it was yeah. kind of like interesting. That's good. Yeah, that is scary because you because it down the surface it sounds oh well, great it's I'm yeah. gonna get it's gonna go into a book my whole chapter I don't have to do anything you're right but that would be really scary right but importantly yeah. the issue is sharing information and this yeah. happened to be a, a statewide study looking at resources for people with intellectual disability and rating each state you know with, I did it with two people that are now medical doctors you know and I thought yeah that would be great for them too. And it's like, no, I was nervous. It's like, this, this just doesn't, plus publishing a book chapter means you have to go out and find Right, right, yeah. yeah. But I think it's, it's interesting, though, to think about all we want to do is just what get that hear. information yeah. out right. there, right? right. That's, really, that's really what this is all about as well. So I know we're getting really low. I'm on sorry. Um, what I'll do is, so you can, just, you can step back and sort of think about do I want to utilize open access as a way of getting my information out there for public consumption? Um, it, what, what happens with those authors' rights? And I think that we were talking, I think a copyright is a whole other topic. Yeah. Um, because I had no idea, and I've been signing away those rights all along, but, but, but maybe this is a much better way to do it where I'm not signing away those rights. Um, with open access, you get that wide distribution of your, your literature. You get to promote your author, uh, your, yourself, as well as show your, your work. Um, and, and it also just gets equitable access to research. Again, especially when there's research methods involved, to increase the rigor and respons responsibility, I think is phenomenal. Um, so, so there are some real reasons, I think, to, to be able to consider open access. So did you want to, was there anything else that you wanted to add on this one? Uh. Well, I'll just say um, right now there there is no uh, effort to establish an open access mandate at, at Drexel. That is not something that um, would come from the library anyway. That would need to come from probably the faculty senate. Um, but if anyone is interested in that, we're happy to to talk about it and see if that's something that we can um, be involved in the discussions. Uh, but that's definitely a faculty driven um discussion um and let's see institutional repositories um are great especially we mentioned green open access which is depositing a author accepted manuscript um and that's something that um uh, you know the university has an institutional repository called idea um and right now it's going through some changes but um but we're hoping that becomes a place where faculty can put um, you know, put green open access materials. There are also disciplinary repositories that might get even more traction. Uh, and so that's a conversation that, you know, um, again, you could have with Janice or you could have with, with me. And, you know, that we want your, your, your work to get the attention that it deserves um, and, um, and for you to have, uh, have it where you want it to be. Um, and so if we can help with that process, we're, we're happy to. Um, trying to 
So I mentioned the Sage Open Access membership. Um, that is, uh, that's brand new, um, just started in January. So if you're publishing in a Sage journal, um, it's a 10% discount in the, in the article processing charge. Um, right now, that is the only membership that we have, um, and it came with a larger uh, journal package that we that we licensed. Um, but it is something that we that we keep an eye on. Some of it's a cost benefit analysis. In the past, we haven't always seen the the kind of return that we that we need to be able to continue. Um, but it is something that that is useful. Um, that's. That's basically it. Yeah, that's yeah, I think that I, I, we talked a little bit about that really writing that paper is just the beginning and getting accepted is the next step. But then after that, you really want to market your work, right? And so utilizing social media, having open access, utilizing the library, making sure that even um, Daily Dose knows about it. Really try to get disseminate your information as best possible to highlight your scholarship because you've worked really hard to do it. Um, so these are just um, some questions that I thought, um, although I know our time, actually we're over time. Yeah, we're over time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 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 Well, anyway, <laughs> you guys have them, and, but thank you very much. And let people know about this, too. It, you know, we're happy to share these slides, um, but I think this is an awakening. Right? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you could fill out a survey on your way out the door, that would be terrific. Um, there, the circles are like Scantron, you know, circle. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Uh, next week is um, uh, the 11th Street is doing a series on um, being anti-racist, um, which we're going to, there's an awful number, a lot of people who have signed up to join us online. This is the room we're going to be in, so there's limited seating, but uh, if you're planning to come, please sign up so that we get a sense.